Well, Tata Steel, that's the company which is currently in focus, as is the stock price, reacting acutely to its numbers this morning. You've got the headline third quarter numbers. Well, they may be in line, but clearly it seems like the Forex variations have driven a miss. So let's uh, probe a little deeper into what the quarter went by was like and what the visibility is like going forward. I have with me the MD and CEO of Tara Steel TV, Narendran, joining in on the show right now. Mr. Narendran, good morning. Great to have you on uh, the show. And I'm just looking at the quarterly details because, you know, two quarters ago, Tara Steel Europe was clearly in a very sweet spot. Now things uh, seem to have taken a 360 degree turn altogether. Tell me what went wrong. Thanks, Aisha, for having me on the show. So actually, Europe has obviously had a pretty uh, uh, difficult year. Uh, it started with the uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis because that resulted in two things. One is uh, the demand side uh, became fragile. And more importantly, the input costs, particularly the gas prices and energy prices, shot up. You know, gas prices and energy prices went up to five to six times the normal levels. So you see that playing out. So you had a situation where the coking coal prices went up because of uh, what was happening between Russia and Ukraine. You had energy costs going up, gas prices going up, and demand pretty much uh, being quite fragile. So that got reflected uh, in our numbers, uh, obviously, in Q2 to some extent and to a significant extent uh, in Q3. The second thing because of which uh, the numbers look bad is we are doing some uh, 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 changes to the pensions in the UK. Basically, it's getting, getting transferred to insurance companies, which is uh, good for us in the long term, uh, de-risk the business uh, quite a bit. But that process means there are some non-cash adjustments uh, because of the deferred tax credit that we had on our books. So that was a very significant amount, almost about 2,000 crores, which uh, also played out in the PNL and hence a negative bat. Okay, so let me pick up on those points one by one. Uh, you know, Europe, in fact, uh, Mr. Narendran, has reported loss at an EBITDA level. Now, given that second half was expected to be weaker than first half, could the situation deteriorate then in the fourth quarter before it becomes better? So we see the fourth quarter getting better than the third quarter for a couple of reasons. One is if you look at the third quarter numbers, while the uh, cooking coal Cost came down by about $90 a ton and iron ore prices came down by about $20. Our costs are showing a £31 uh, pounds per ton increase, largely because we have taken some NRV losses on some of the stocks that we had. So that's like a bit of a one-off kind of adjustment and that's why the uh, EBITDA is uh, significantly more negative than most people expected. Uh, secondly, the volumes in Q4 will be higher than the volumes in Q3. So, and thirdly, the gas prices and energy prices have started dropping. And spot steel prices have started going up. So for these reasons, we expect Q4 to be better than Q3, though we are not totally out of the woods yet. Okay, great. You know, that that's that's the clarity, I guess, everyone was looking out for. But could you help me quantify this? I mean, how much better or worse could it get in the fourth quarter, considering you're saying it's not going to be significantly uh, better right away? Yeah. So let me put it this way. I, I can't obviously give you a very specific uh, uh, number, but let me put it this way. The re realizations are going to be about 70 pounds per ton lower simply because the long-term contracts have got renegotiated and the spot prices have not yet caught up with the long-term contract prices, right? So that is one part of it. But the cost will be at least 100 pounds per ton lower, okay? So that gives you some sense of what could be the margin improvement for sure. And then the volumes are going to be about uh, about 200 to 300,000 tons higher in Q4 compared to Q3 for Europe. Okay. Sure, got the picture then. Uh, let's talk about the India operations now. And a lot of price hikes clearly have come through in this calendar year so far. But we understand that these price hikes are just a pass through. You think they're sufficient enough to nullify the impact of the increase in raw material prices? Or do you think you'll have to undertake some more? So I think the margin expansion has started happening in India because uh, the margins were at its lowest level, let's say, in November. You know, uh, because prices dropped in uh, uh, from October to November, started picking up in December when the international prices uh, started going up. So we expect uh, margin expansion to continue, but all the price increases will not flow through the bottom line because there are uh, cost increases. May not be for this quarter. For this quarter, we expect the cooking coal consumption cost to be about ten dollars per ton lower than last quarter in India. But we are seeing that next quarter, that is Q1 of next year. 
some of the higher price cooking coal because today cooking coal prices are in the 320 to 340 dollar range whereas it was about 250 to 280 dollar range uh, two months back right so that will start flowing through in the q1 of next year uh, but overall we see volume expansion and margin expansion continue in india okay so if i have to specifically pinpoint prices domestic pr prices are currently at say about 59 to 60000 odd per ton could they head to 65 to 70 I know I'm trying to put you in a spotlight here. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's, uh, Aisha, it will depend a lot on the international markets. What happens in China after the Chinese New Year? Uh, if it comes back strongly, uh, that will uh, give a fillip to international prices. You would have also seen that uh, most of the steel industry in the world over the last two quarters was struggling from a bottom line point of view. So we pretty much hit the bottom as far as uh, margins are concerned for the industry. So everyone is looking at improving the margins. So I'm. Uh, it's going to reflect international prices, but uh, clearly we are at 60,000 levels. Uh, as you know, it had gone to 75. We don't expect things to go to that level, but I think uh, between 60 and 65 is certainly a range we are looking at. But tell me, I know it's as much a black box for us as it is for you, but perhaps you have a better reading. What is the China situation right now? Well, a uh, uh, number of things. I think, uh, you know, China's or, uh, honestly surprised us in a positive way in the last three, four weeks. Uh, firstly, I think uh, the decision they took on uh, reversing the COVID policy uh, has been hugely impactful. And a lot of consumption is coming back into China because over the last uh, two, three years, uh, I understand the savings rate in China, which is typically about 25%, had gone up to about 35%. Just like we saw in India, once the uh, COVID-related restrictions are over, a lot of people are going to travel a lot more, spend a lot more. So that's one fillip to the economic activity. Second thing is the Chinese government has taken a number of steps to stabilize the property markets. And uh, there's an expectation that the property markets will stabilize and is coming back because uh, a lot of the revenues of the state or the provinces depend on the success of the property market. So there is a lot of interest uh, in the Chinese government also to stabilize the property markets and construction consumes 60% of the steel uh, that is consumed in China. If you look at automobiles, they are back to 2 million vehicles a month, uh, you know, which is pretty close to the peak levels. So in many, and China itself is making a change towards uh, being a more consumption-led growth. So you may not see the 8 to 10 percent growth they had in the past, but I think they are expecting a 5 percent growth for an economy of that size. 5 percent is a lot of growth. And I think uh, that's why we're quite positive uh, about China. And, uh, uh, you know, the other interesting thing, Aisha, is even though China went through a very difficult year, uh, Chinese exports was never the problem over the last six, seven months, right? Uh, so even in difficult times, we have not been impacted by exports from China. And that's positive for the steel industry globally because that was a big challenge that we had to deal with maybe four or five years back. Uh, I want to talk about Tata Steel UK before we wind up because, you know, there are some news reports which are indicating that the UK government is planning to grant support to Tata Steel for uh, to try and transition to green steel. I want to understand what exactly are the stocks, uh, you know, the talks right now and where do things stand and whether you're getting active support from the UK government for this transition. So, Aisha, the UK government is actively involved in a conversation with us. Uh, we had sent them a proposal. They have sent us another proposal. So we are in discussion to see, uh, you know, whether we can find a solution that works for everyone. Obviously, uh, from a UK government point of view, uh, they have a commitment as a nation to become greener. And the steel industry is a very important part of that transition into a greener future. Uh, we are a very important part of the manufacturing ecosystem in, uh, in the UK. Uh, so hence, we're looking at what could be the way forward. Uh, like I said, the conversations are going on. UK has an advantage of having scrap. Uh, they export scrap. Uh, you can make greener steel using scrap than by importing iron ore or coal. But UK has a disadvantage in terms of high energy costs. Uh, so these are the conversations that we are having. The other point is all across Europe, basically steel companies are telling governments that there has to be some capex support for the transition. And the general ask is, 50% of the transition costs, uh, capex cost for transition should be supported by the government in terms of ways of grants, etc. And there has to be some support in OPEX because, uh, you know, coal prices, metallurgical coal prices reflected steel prices. Whereas if you switch from metallurgical coal to gas or hydrogen, gas or hydrogen prices need not reflect steel prices. So how do you secure your OPEX 
you know, in such an environment. And that's why uh, all steel companies in Europe are having conversations with the relevant governments to see what is the OPEC support that can also be provided. So these are conversations going on. I think over the next year or two, Europe, multiple countries in Europe will uh, make their roadmap and uh, hopefully we'll be part of it. But do you think this ask is going to be granted from the UK government? And I ask purely because their own economy is in a very fragile state. Absolutely. So there are obviously limitations on what support they can give us. Uh, obviously, from our point of view, uh, you know, we need to look at whether that support is enough or if not, what do we do? So these are the conversations which are going on just now. But yes, uh, the, there is active to engagement. Exit UK sides. altogether, are you? Sorry? You're not contemplating a altogether UK exit, are you? So Aisha, any, anything that we do has a cost uh, implication, right? So we just need to think about what is the best way forward and evaluate what is best for Tata Steel. So you're, opening to, uh, you're open to exiting altogether? I don't want to say that because it's too early to say that. But I think uh, let's first, we have explored all options or we've done a lot over the last many years and we are continuing to explore options. Okay, fair point. We'll leave it at that, Mr. Narendra. And always great uh, chatting with you. Thank you so much for your time.